This is for Keeps, a podcast about collections and connections. I'm David Peterkovsky. This is a collector's story that's rich in history, mystery, and intrigue, so much so that it inspired a book, a tale with so many twists and turns, that its publisher describes it as the Raiders of the Lost Ark of Wine. It's a story about an incredible collection of wines, and of two collectors— One, an Australian businessman and wine enthusiast with a keen sense of adventure. And the other, a notorious dictator who for nearly three decades ruled the Soviet Union with an iron fist. I guess with that music, I'd better start with the dictator. In case you haven't figured it out, the dictator in question is Joseph Stalin, who assumed leadership of the Soviet Union in 1924, following the death of Vladimir Lenin. During his brutal reign, Stalin reshaped the Soviet Union from a peasant society into an industrial and military superpower. But he ruled by terror, responsible for the deaths of over 20 million people. When he wasn't enforcing Soviet totalitarianism, orchestrating purges, and establishing gulag labor camps, he was apparently enjoying at least one benefit of his standing as head of state access to an incredible collection of wines, dating back as far as the mid-1800s, including rare and exceedingly valuable wines produced by some of the premier French winemaking chateaus, Margaux, Latour, Lafitte, and Ikem. The collection actually originated with Russia's last Tsar, the wine-loving Nicholas II, and later ended up in the possession of the state, which is when Stalin added to it over time. During World War II, As the Soviets dealt with the possibility of an invasion by Nazi Germany, Stalin was concerned that the advancing Nazi army might loot artifacts and treasures if an invasion was to take place. With that in mind, the Soviets secretly removed a portion of the collection from St. Petersburg and relocated it to a remote winery in the then-Soviet Republic of Georgia, which also happened to be Stalin's birthplace. And that's where it remained for decades hidden from the outside world, at least until John Baker came along. He's the Australian businessman who, while working as a high-end wine retailer and importer in the 1990s, learned about Stalin's wine cellar from associates with connections to Georgia, a place that had recently become an independent republic following the breakup of the Soviet Union. Working with his contacts, and with Kevin Hopko, the manager of his wine shop in Sydney, John set out to learn more about the wines hidden away in Georgia, with the goal of possibly purchasing the collection in its entirety and selling the wines at a London auction house, if they could be authenticated. John's quest to get this mysterious collection of wines is the subject of a book he's co-written. The book, called Stalin's Wine Cellar, has more twists than a vine of Old World Chardonnay grapes, and more turns than a corkscrew. And while I won't give away how the story ends, you'll have to read the book for that. I can say that John's book is an exciting, informative, and often hilarious read. And when it's not teaching the reader about world history and world-class wines, it's telling quite the story, with a cast of characters that includes a scene-stealing bunch of gun-toting Georgian businessmen who make for interesting business bedfellows with the mild-mannered Aussies. John's colorful story is one chapter in a long and colorful career that started with his work in the hospitality industry. It was while working in the world of hotels that John also entered into the wine business. I had hotels early on. Actually, I think I had my first hotel in my uh, mid to late 20s. I took over my first hotel a week before Christmas, and I didn't know how to tap a keg. Well, I can tell you, I learned pretty quickly. (laughs) Then I bought a, a big rock and roll pub with a partner, in, this was in the um, early 80s when in Australia and Sydney or in Melbourne, uh, rock and roll was very big on what they call the pub circuit and the bands like In Excess, Men at Work, Cold Chisel. I mean, there's a great Australian band you may, or may not have heard of. 
Uh, they used to do the circuit of the various hotels, and I had one of those hotels. But I thought, I remember getting home one night after having a huge night. I think we had 2,000 people in our lounge, and this was when smoking was allowed in hotels here, smelling somewhere between a cigarette factory and a, a brewery, and I thought, I'm not sure how much longer I want to be doing this for, but I quite like those bottles of wine. So we sold that hotel, and I bought my first wine store and really learnt from then on. Among his most successful wine shop endeavours was Double Bay Cellars, which was located in the well-heeled eastern suburbs of Sydney and catered to a well-connected clientele. When we had the shop in Double Bay and I had other stores, I always believed in, in retailing and probably every business. You have to have a point of difference. Otherwise, you're just in, in wine stores. You're just another wine store on the corner like other wine stores. And our point of difference was old and rare wine. And we particularly hunted or we had the opportunity to buy private sellers at times. In the early days, we'd buy wines at auction. And it became almost a self-generating business in that the more, particularly because of our prestigious position, the market we had there, and because we were making a bit of noise about having old and rare wine, back vintage wine from what most stores had, um, people would come to us and say, oh, we've got this wine or our grandfather had this wine, he's not allowed to drink anymore or something and would you like to buy it the whole cellar or and various opportunities like that. And also it attracted some of the what we might call journeymen of the industry who had something to do with the industry and always seemed to have fine wines and always wanted to be trading. And the one we uh, was particularly was a chap called Harry Zucker and Harry was um, – what we, we refer to as an Eastern European gentleman <laughs> with always had opportunities. So Harry would come along with what he'd call a deal, which often might be a private seller or maybe just some bottles or something. One day in the late 1990s, Harry Zuckor reached out to John at Double Bay Cellars in a very late 1990s way. The fax machine started whirring and pages started coming off the fax machine. I picked up the front page and just looked at it and had interested question mark and it was from Harry and then 30 pages poured off the fax machine and it was obviously wine or supposedly wine but we couldn't work out what it was but when Harry puts on the cover page interested question mark if for Harry to underplay something it means he's really got something so I took all the pages off and had a look at this list and they were Names, but not names that I recognised. They weren't the great wines of the world as I expected or great wines of Australia or anything, and that was a bit confusing. But the second column had what I assume were dates, and it had 1856, 1898, 1910, 1847, all down these pages. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. But this was 100 years older than anything we'd, we'd really dealt with. So that really threw me a bit. Although he was thrown by the list, and certainly intrigued by it, John did what he says he's done throughout his career when exciting things have come his way. He played it cool. I'm a great believer if you think you've got something or something's interesting, don't knock yourself out because you won't get it, but just leave it in the back of your mind, and when you're walking down the street one day or cooking dinner or something, the penny will drop. And... We had went that seller I was saying that we bought uh, Beacon Hill and we took it back and we had a, one, a big sale over a weekend where we had publicised it and we had all our best customers there. And on the Monday, a chap came into the store and he said, do you have any of that Chateau de Uchem? I can't even actually remember what he said, but he mispronounced the great French dessert wine Chateau Uchem because it looks awkward to say. And um, I said, no, sorry, sir, you know, we did have some, but we sold it all on the weekend. And when he went out, I thought, hello. And I went back to the list that I had, and on the list there was this wine, I-K-E-M, Ikem. And I remember when I first looked at the list, I thought, Ikea, Ikea wine, I don't want any Ikea wine. <laughs> but then I started to realise what this list was. This was a phonetic list of the great wines of the world. And I thought, well, somewhere in the world, someone has been reading the labels on these great French wines like Chateau Margaux, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, Chateau Akem, and recording them in their language, whatever that was. 
And then at some stage, this list has been translated back to English. So you end up with a phonetic translation. So you end up with something like the Chateau Akem, which is correctly spelt small d apostrophe capital Y Q U E M. Phonetically, it's Akem. And it turns out that they were being recorded in Georgian. So when that's translated back to English, you end up with Akem, I K E M. And Margot correctly pronounced, I spelt M A R G A U X. On the list was M A R G O T. And、uh, Chateau Latour correctly is L A T O U R. And on this list is L A T U R, I think. So it's quite simple once you know, but you've got to know. <laughs> so that's how we got wind of this. And when you saw all these names on this cryptic fax, I mean, did it seem plausible to you that a collection like that could actually exist somewhere, or did it seem too good to be true? Certainly too good to be true. Highly unlikely. But when this is your business, or this is a very important part of your business, this is possibly a collection of wine that no one ever heard of. You know, do you go in a junk shop thinking you're going to find a Rembrandt? No, but you might. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I thought it was. Too good to be true, but I wasn't going to dismiss it that easily. Uh huh. And so your sense of adventure kind of took over. And at what point did you learn that it was wine that had belonged to Joseph Stalin? <laughs>、um, so when、uh, I worked out, or I thought I may have worked out what this list meant, we contacted Harry Zucker, who faxed us the list, and I、uh, rang my store manager Kevin,、uh, who's in the book. I said, Kevin, I might have the key to this list. So he came in and had a look, and he says, "This is extraordinary. If this was possible, this could be one of the greatest unknown wine cellars in the world. It's extraordinary what's here." And so we contacted Harry, and Harry was pretty smug about it because <laughs> Harry just is that way. And I said, to "Harry, I said the list's phonetic, isn't it?" And he said, "Yes, that's right." And I said. So whose list is it, and where's it from? And he said, "I'll have to get、uh, Neville to tell you who was his contact." And this chap, Neville Rhodes, was involved in a, a gold mine in Georgia, and his partner in the gold mine had bought a number of buildings. This was in the reprivatisation of property in Georgia, because the Russians, after the、um, Berlin Wall came down in 1989, I think Georgia became a republic in 19. Uh, sorry, nineteen ninety-two, ninety-three. I'm not sure. And we were there in ninety-nine. One of the partners' contacts in the wild, wild west of newly independent Georgia was a man, fittingly enough, named George. George, who was George in Georgia, of course. <laughs> He、um, had an old winery, and when they went downstairs and looked in all the cellars, they found all this old wine. Their story was that this was part of the cellar. Of the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, and when、um, Nicholas, of course, when the Russian Revolution and Nicholas II was taken out and removed, Lenin took over, and then Lenin only lasted, I think, four or five years before he died, and then Stalin took over, and with the advent of the Second World War, Stalin was quite concerned that Hitler was going to overrun Russia, so he started moving artifacts out. And one part went to the Masandra Winery in the Crimea, which is the national winery, and this other part went to Tbilisi in Georgia because Stalin was a Georgian, and it was sent there to not be found. And it wasn't found until this fax started whirring off the machine in our shop in Double Bay. And how much of the wine's potential resale value would you say was tied to the fact that it had been in the possession of Stalin and before that Tsar Nicholas II? Well, how do you value provenance? That was that was something we really had no idea what it was. Kevin, my manager of the store, Kevin was quite good on numbers, and and even to this day, he still buys and sells wine all around the world. And he, this was his forte more than mine. But、um, we were offered the seller for one million dollars US. There was forty thousand bottles, and Kevin roughly valued it at about seven to eight million dollars. And that probably wasn't adding up much for the what we think is extraordinary provenance. That was just value of these sort of wines on the market. So we we're on the right side of the ledger. I mean, how far we're on the right side, who would know? Uh huh. And what did you know about Georgia before your first trip there? Much of anything? Very little. <laughs> I knew where it was, and that was about it. 
But once he was in this mysterious land, he learned plenty, and the real work began. John and Kevin began going through the contents of the cellar as best they could, trying to determine the authenticity of what was there. And how quickly were you and Kevin able to ascertain with relative confidence that the wines in the cellar were likely to be the real thing? Well, the only way we were going to know anything was we had to go there and look at them, which we did. Uh, so we went to Tbilisi in Georgia. We spent, I think it was about four days underground, really just checking the bottles against the list we had. That's what we worked off because we were offered this 40,000 bottles for a million dollars based on this list. So the 30 pages of list we had on the top, you know, shelf 13 or shelf 6 or shelf 3 or and these are these incredible shelves of wines just going off into the gloom of the cellar. So I would say, shelf five, I've got Chateau Margot. What do you have? And Potro, who was one of George's helpers, shall we say, spoke quite good English. He was Chechenian. He and Kevin had the marketing manager, and he explained to him how the cellar book worked. So I'd say, you know, shelf five, uh, Chateau Margot, what do you have? And Potro would go down the list and say, oh, Chateau Margot, 1896, uh, seven bottles. And I'd go, hmm, that's exactly what I've got. I'd say, okay, could you pull those out? And we took some very bright fluoro lamps because I'd seen s- some photographs of the cellar that Neville showed us in, in, uh, in Sydney. It was quite gloomy and dark. We put those behind the bottles so we could see the fill levels and also the colour of the wine. And then we'd have a good look at the bottles and I would scrape a bit of the capsule off so I can read the cork because in most of the great chateaus, they stamp their corks like it'll have Chateau Margot 1896 or whatever it was. And we just did that repetitively for days on end. Of all the amazing wines in Stalin's collection, the ones from Chateau Ikem, that tricky to spell Bordeaux winemaker specializing in sweet white wines were among the ones John and Kevin were most keen on seeing. We were particularly interested in Chateau Akem because there was 217 bottles from the 1800s and the early 1900s. I think the youngest wine was 1924, if I can remember correctly. And in that, there are three bottles of 1847, which I think even to today is still the most expensive white wine ever sold in the world at auction anyway. So there's three bottles, and I think today, if you could find a bottle, if it was genuine, if it was in good condition, um, I think it's about $200,000 for that. So there's three bottles of that in the cellar with unbelievable provenance. That's how we authenticated the set wine. And as we went to more and more wines, and we're reasonably experienced at handling not this old but rare and mature wines, you get a real feel for it. I thought, these wines, this is pretty genuine. It would be pretty hard to fake at that scale. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, you know, when we went down into the cellar and they turned on the lights, it was just a, a few bulbs you know, just glowing, and there's racks and racks of wines going off into the distance, into the gloom. Half or more were covered with cobwebs, and I thought, boy, you know, if this is a fraud, this is almost a George Lucas special effects performance to fake 40,000 bottles. But there's no faking the taste of a wine, which is something that John, Kevin, and the Georgians on hand in the cellar got to experience, somewhat unexpectedly. When we went down the first day and we had a number of the Georgian wine people, uh, we had <clears throat> Mr. Ravaz, who's the chief winemaker, Mr. Tamaz, who was the general manager, George, of course, a few of George's henchmen were there who were walking around with guns in their pockets all the time. <laughs> but um, Mr. Uh, Ravaz, the chief winemaker, wandered along one of the rows and he looked into the rack and he pulled a bottle out. And the cellar was very wet, dripping wet. And um, as Mr. Ravaz came back towards us, he moved the bottle from one hand to another. And as he moved it to the other, it slipped and fell forward. And I quickly thrust my foot out and got my foot under it and broke its fall and then scooped it up with my hand like, you know, catching a ball off the ground. Fortunately, the neck of the bottle broke off and maybe my foot under it stopped it's shattering more, and I scooped up the bottom of the bottle and had a bottle of wine in my hand minus the neck, and I still had the liquid. 
and it had a bit of label when I looked at it. It was 1899 Chateau Sudero, the great Saturn house, just down the road from Chateau Ekem. So I was standing there with a bottle of 1899 Sudero, 100 years old to the day that we were there. Wow. And how was it? Well, we, every, of course, everyone went red, and Mr. Ravaz, of course, was very embarrassed, and he ambled off to disappear, more or less. And Kevin, my manager, who has a sense of humor and doesn't miss an opportunity, says, oh, thank you, Mr. Ravaz. Now we get to taste the wine, which we did. This was the first wine we got to taste. And this is very important because if this wine wasn't brilliant or what we expect, then we're on the first plane out. And the wine was sublime. It really was exceptional. I know Chateau Sudero quite well. I'd imported many vintages of it. I'd certainly never tasted something 100 years old. But Sudero is a more elegant style of Saturn. And this was a very elegant, fine, ethereal, beautiful, fine, tingling acidity. It was, it was superb. And I think, as I say in the book, the Sudero is superb, but the orchestra was deafening, <laughs> the orchestra in my head. <laughs> um, this was saying that this was genuine. So this was quite a revelation. But, of course, we lost a bottle of 1899 Sudero because it was broken, but we had very good reason to become very serious about these wines. Throughout the book, you seem to make it clear that while you have a tremendous passion and appreciation for amazing wines, if this deal fell apart at any minute, it doesn't seem like it would have bothered you all that much. Is that accurate? Um, somewhat, in that I thought the whole adventure, if you want to call it, is so unlikely, so improbable, that the bubble might burst. <laughs> it, might, it might all be not happening. No, I, and I also I've got a fairly pragmatic view of these things. Yeah, you know, we were there on a, a women of prayer almost, you know, on a very highly speculative visit to see if these wines were genuine. You know, could we buy them? Could we move them? How are we going to move them? How are we going to get them out of Georgia if, if they were true and all this? And it was an incredible opportunity, incredible adventure. And if it didn't work, well, I can't do much more than I'm doing. So, yeah, I was fairly pragmatic in my view of it all. Yeah, I was prepared for it not to work if it didn't work. And in the breaking of, of that, and there was another bottle a bit later that unfortunately broke, you know, there are only bottles of wine. I remember one of my great friends in Bordeaux, when I told him about this wine and um, breaking, he says, you know, John, everybody in the industry has broken a great bottle at some stage. And I don't know if I have other than that, but sure, you know, occasionally accidents happen. So at one point in the book, several bottles do make it out of Georgia with the goal of getting them authenticated and then proceeding with the deal with the Georgians. So how did you go through tens of thousands of bottles to decide which ones to ask for? Yeah, that was a little bit tricky. When Before we left Australia, I had some communication with George in Georgia, and I said to him, you know, we'll need to take some bottles to Australia or, or we would like to take them to the chateaus to say, you know, is this your wine? In the cellar, there is Cos d'Estonel, Great Saint Estef, there's Lafitte, Mouton Rothschild, Margot, Latour, and of course Chateau Akem, which is the wine we're particularly interested in. And remember, we were only there to do a reconnaissance. We weren't there to buy wine or sell wine or move wine. We just were there to see if, if this was genuine and could we pull this off. So I raised the point. I said, Oh, George, you know, I, as you might remember, we talked about taking 12 bottles back to the chateaus. And, of course, that was an instant problem. Oh, Johnny says, oh, that's going to be very difficult. And I said, George, you might remember where this was part of our agreement. And, oh, well. So I selected some. And, I, yeah, I, I must say, I don't think I did a very good selection because although I did take two bottles of a chem, I didn't take an 1847, which I would like to have, but when I showed George my list, he said, there's only three bottles of that. You can't take one of those. They didn't actually know what they had. They knew this was pretty good wine. They knew this was French. They knew it had a value, but they didn't really know anything about wine and really didn't know the quality of what they had. 
So I took some wines, and I really don't know why I took them, but I think I was also playing a slightly diplomatic role in that I was taking some of the George, old Georgian wines to look at those. So anyway, I, yeah, I selected 12 bottles. I'm not quite sure what was going through my head at the time, but <laughs> we got what we got. Sure. So if it's not too painful, can we talk a bit about the bottle of Ikem that met its maker, literally? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um so one of the bottles we took was an 1870 Akem. We couldn't read the fourth digit on the cork. I scraped the capsule and just couldn't quite read that fourth digit, but it was 1870-something. It didn't have a label. So we took these bottles back to Australia and life went on. And then I was, you know, my, um, I had a business, Bordeaux Shippers. We we're importing Bordeaux wines to Australia. And, of course, Chateau Akem is a Bordeaux. And I was going to Bordeaux one time and Kevin, he said, why don't you take the bottle of a chem to a chem and get them to authenticate it? We really need to know that it is genuine, although we we're pretty sure it was. So we were taking this bottle to Chateau Chem and I had a great friend in Bordeaux who used to, when I was importing Bordeaux, he used to organise most of my visits to Chateau's um, Jean-Francois Bourat La Couture was his name. And he knew about our venture of going to Georgia and I said, do you think we can get an appointment with the chief winemaker with Sandrine Gabay or Pierre Leton, who's the director general, to authenticate this wine? So Jean-Francois organised an appointment with Sandrine Gabay and everything was fine and we were going to Bordeaux and been in London the night before and had a big dinner and we had a very early flight into Paris the next morning and um, as well as with my partner, Jane. So we arrived in, in Paris and we had normal carrying bags, and then we had a wine bag. And I said to Jane in the taxi, I said, just keep that wine bag on your shoulder because that's where the Akem was, and there's a few other wines in there, you know, proper wine bag, more or less keeping each other stable, you know. And when we arrived at the hotel, um, the hotel staff were pulling bags out of the taxi, and, and out of the corner of my eye I saw one bag fall over, and I thought, that's the wine bag. I jumped over there, picked it up, and it was dripping, and I zipped the top open, and the chem had broken, which uh, was devastating at the time. But I guess, you know, it was a 150-year-old bottle, probably had some fragility that I hadn't considered enough, and it had just cracked across the bottom of the bottle. But I quickly turned it upside down, so I, had in, I was standing on the footpath in Paris with an 1870 Chateau Akem <laughs> leaking. So I was doing my best not to have a heart attack or a stroke. No medical emergencies ensued, but John and his companion were able to fill what was left of the wine into two empty Perrier bottles, filled to the brim and sealed up tight so that no oxygen could alter them. And it was with those two unorthodox vessels that John traveled to the esteemed Chateau Ikem. I'm wondering when you got to Ikem, were you worried that they might turn you away when you showed up with these Perrier bottles full of allegedly ancient wine? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Um, with a museum bottle of Ikem. I think I spoke to Jean-Francois that day or that next day. And I couldn't bring myself to tell him that I'd broken the bottle. But when we arrived in Bordeaux, I think the day before we were going to a chem, when we met Jean-Francois, I said, Jean-Francois, I've just got something to tell you, that um, we've got the wine, but unfortunately I broke it. <laughs> he looked at me with eyes popping out of his head. And I told him the story, and I've got, them in, I've got it in two little Perrier bottles. And you know, after, after he heard the story, he actually burst out laughing. He <laughs> says, <laughs> I can't believe it, except I do believe it. Um, and I think it was when he said, we've all broken a, a famous bottle at some stage. But I said, not this famous, John Francois. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, he said, well, he says, you know, well, we, we have an appointment with Sandrin Gabe tomorrow. You know, why don't we go anyway? I mean... You know, maybe she'll look at it and maybe she won't, but he said, who knows, you might be the first Australian to be thrown out of Chateau Akem. <laughs> <laughs> the Perrier bottles, as well as the original bottle that had broken, were presented to Sandrine, the winemaker. The cork broke when they tried to remove it, so they never did find out the fourth digit of the year, but they got to work checking the bottle's contents. 
she then opened one of the Perrier bottles and poured it into glasses and she poured it around so we could all taste it. And she called Pierre Leton, who's the Director General of Chateau Chem. Although he's there, he probably doesn't taste a Chem from the 1800s that often. And then Sandra turned around to me and said, oh, what did the wine taste like two days ago when, when you first? I said, oh, it, was, it probably was a little bit brighter, a bit sharper, um, it's, it's showing a slight um, sherry-like character now, which happens with wine as it becomes oxidised. But it, it was not dissimilar to what's now. And she turned around and they had a conversation and then she turned back to me and said, this is a chem, this is our wine. And I, of course, was in fairly hallowed company there in, in Chateau Chem, and I think I was very polite and said, oh, thank you, Sandra, and that's very good of you. And inside I was going, yes, that's just what I wanted to hear. <laughs> of course, I couldn't do anything about the broken bottle, but she had pretty well had authenticated that this as being Chateau Chem, which I was pretty sure it was. But to have her and Pierre Leton confirm it, of course, put incredible value on the other 215 or 16 bottles in the cellar. Uh -huh. So without giving away the ending of the book, I do want to ask you about the wines from Stalin's cellar that you might still have from when you and Kevin were there. Do you still have any of them besides this one? Uh, yeah. Um, when we went to Georgia, the four parties that, shall we say, were involved, which was uh, Harry Zucker, who had the list and sent it to me, and then Neville Rhodes and myself and Kevin. So we decided that we were four partners in this excursion experience, and we were equal partners in any rewards. So and when we came back, obviously, Neville became agitated that it was taking too long, and he was the contact with George and Georgia, so he told us that he'd turned around and bought the whole cellar himself, which didn't prove to be actually correct. But anyway, so we thought, well, oh, okay, well, this is finished, and so we divided the 12 bottles between the four of us, and I think we lost... Uh, an 1850-something Chateau Coutet, which still had a label, and we lost one of the Akems to Neville and Harry Zuckor, and I think the Margot went to one of those, and Kevin and I ended up with eight bottles, but we ended up with the old Georgian wines, which hardly were valuable compared to the Akem and Margot and all that sort of thing, so whatever. So I think we still have a Mouton. The um, capsule is Branair Mouton, which is what, Mouton was called in the 1800s before it was renamed Mouton Rothschild. And I think most of the other wines we have are Georgian Cognac and uh, Georgian Madeira, not really what you call the fabulous wines of the cellar. But that's, I think, that's what we have, and I don't know what we're going to do with them. Every couple of years, one of us says, how many of those Georgian wines have you got? How many have you got? Can't remember. I think I might have two or – so, yeah, I think we've both got them somewhere, but, yeah, we don't know what to do with them. So <laughs> they just sit there without a decision being made. <laughs> um, so let's talk a bit about your own collection of wines, apart from anything tied to this adventure or your, or your work. What does the personal wine collection of John Baker look like in terms of size and variety and maybe some special areas of interest? Yeah, um, <laughs> it tends to be the leftovers of owning – wine shops and importing businesses <laughs> in that in each case I sold the business and I'd keep some wine because at the time it interested me and particularly when I owned Australian shops, uh, wine shops here in Australia, I knew less about wine than I do now and so I'd sell a store and I'd go, oh, I'll keep some of that great Australian wine like Penfolds Grange or Hensky Hill of Grace are probably one of the other great ones. I'd keep some of that. But you end up keeping wines that you lose interest in because those wines are, I don't know if you know them, but they're sort of quite bold Australian Shiraz-based wines. And as your palate matures and develops, you end up preferring wines with a bit more finesse and different characters and you end up in, in Europe as your palate matures and you find that as you get more exposure to the great wines of France and Italy and Spain um, and some of the Californian wines, of course, as well, are of that style. So I don't have that much Australian wine in my cellar. I've got a certain amount of Bordeaux, but it's really just odds and ends. Chateaus I particularly like, like Chateau Pichon Baron, Pichon de Lande, two great second growths from Pouillac, I particularly like Margot, I particularly like 
but I've only got two bottles of this and one bottle of that and three bottles of something else. I'm Actually, these days, I'm more interested in what is supposedly a very good wine that I don't know of, and I don't really mind what country it comes from. Um, so if someone says, oh, you know, I've got this Bulgarian Cabernet, for example, and it's really good, and I go, wow, that's interesting, so I, I want to taste that. But anyway, I sort of flop around. <laughs> You're more of a wine tourist at this point. Yeah, quite. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One last question for you. Wine collecting and appreciation can be quite overwhelming for the uninitiated, from the types of wine to the regions and the vintages. So for somebody who's just starting to think about exploring the world of wine and building up a collection, what's one piece of advice you would give to the novice wine enthusiast? Yeah, the great wines of the world are not great because of the smell and taste. The great wines of the world, the real strength is their texture, their mouthfeel, their finesse, their length, their complexity. And so I think uh, if I could say to anyone, you know, don't be overawed by weight of the wine or power. Although I'm a fan of Robert Parker in, in many ways, you know, the, the term of a Parkerized wine meaning they're very obvious and rich and very ag agreeable in a almost uh, superficial way. I said, be careful of those wines. So be most respectful of finesse and elegance and those sort of factors. And read Hugh Johnson. <laughs> Arguably the greatest book ever written on wine was called The Story of Wine, written by Hugh Johnson, the English wine writer, whose words are brilliant and his assessment of wine, I think, is just brilliant. Actually, if I can finish, I'll give you a quote here. I've got a, one of Hugh Johnson's. He says, Fine wines detach themselves from the rest, not by their pretensions, but by their conversation. The conversation, that is, that they provoke and stimulate, even, and sometimes I think, by joining in themselves. And I think that's particularly meaningful because if you're in a situation with friends and there's a great wine on the table, it's not background music. You can't ignore it. It demands attention. It's so interesting and so fascinating and so that it will, as he says, join in the conversation itself almost. And it is a living, breathing organism. Yeah, exactly. And it's fascinating. Uh-huh. Well, John, the bottle is empty, which is my clunky way of saying I'm out of questions. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for filling me in on your adventures in Tbilisi and the enigmatic collection of incredible wines in the cellar of Stalin and your adventures in getting close to them. And the book is a really fun read, too. This has been a lot of fun. Good. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. And I thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to tell you about it. Hopefully, we'll meet one day and share a bottle. That would be amazing. Okay. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Well, John Baker has certainly had some interesting adventures in the world of wine over the course of his career. But these days, he's really only a fan of wines. In fact, he's recently pivoted his career to manufacturing and retailing another liquid gem created from the pressing of fruit, and that's olive oil. So if John's looking to do a sequel to his wine book, maybe there's a world leader from a bygone era with a stockpile of olive oil somewhere. It could happen. After all, as his first book proves, the truth can be stranger than fiction. For Keeps is a production of me, David Peterkovsky. My thanks to John Baker for talking in depth about his quest to get close to the wine collection of Joseph Stalin and for sharing his thoughts about wine appreciation and collecting in general. At ForKeepsPodcast.com, you'll see photos of John and his partner in wine, Kevin Hopko, as well as the wine cellar in Georgia, and the list that helped unlock the mystery of what was in the cellar, and more. You'll also find a link to more information on John's fun book, Stalin's Wine Cellar, which he co-wrote with Nick Place. The show's theme song is by Still Flyin', and the closing theme is by Eric Frisch. Additional music for this episode was provided by Mew and Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening to For Keeps. Until next time, keep on keeping on. <laughs> <laughs>